Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. And the Lord said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. We're going to talk about that principle very quickly. It shouldn't be a long conversation, but nevertheless it's a very um, purposeful and poignant conversation. What do you think he's trying to tell us here? Do whatever it takes to abide with me. That's exactly right. The bottom line is you have to be do, willing to do whatever it takes to abide in Him. Whatever measures have to be. So he's not saying immediately jump to the worst possible scenario for what should happen, but he says you can't avoid the worst possible scenario if that's what it takes to make it happen. So clearly there are other steps that we can take in advance before we have to get to that stage. But he says, look, if you've exhausted all the other options and you just can't help yourself, it's better to gouge your eyes out or cut your hand off. Because if you don't, if you're unwilling to take the degree of measure necessary to eradicate sin from your life, you won't make it. Now, who does God implicate as the responsible party here? Him or us? Us. So, there are a couple of terms I'm going to give you here. One is monergism and the other is synergism. Monergism essentially means there is only one party that is responsible. Synergism means that there are two parties or more that must work together in order for the function to be successful. Okay? Why is this important? Because there are a number of professing Christian uh, groups that are monergistic in their belief. Which means only one party can be responsible. The problem with any monergistic thinking is... You only have two options for the parties. You have God or man. In synergism, you have God and man. But in monergism, you have one or the other. The problem is, when we think monergistically, we think God's going to do everything for us. Such thinking makes lazy disobedient children. No different than if you were growing up and you thought your parents were going to do everything. Okay? As we grow, we learn that we have to make our own bed, we have to pick up our own toys, we have to pick up our own clothes, right? And as we get older and older, we have to do more and more for ourselves with the tools that have been provided to us by our parents, right? Because the other side of monergism is that it leads us to believe that God is going to do everything to us also. That's exactly right. The other side of monergism is God is going to do everything to us. But not only do we not have to do anything, but anything that does happen is God's fault. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. And so there are some major self-proclaimed Christian religions that are monergistic some of which you know and some of which you don't know. In their thinking, God does everything. You just go along for the ride. And this is the problem with, for example, the thinking of infant baptism as meaningful at all. 
because they think that kind of puts you in this sealed container where now everything after that's all God's responsibility. And so it's important to remember passages like we just read because without question, he is only speaking to people who can hear him. Remember, he's gone up on the mountain and he's waited for those that were interested in hearing from him to follow him up the mountain and spend time with him. To set aside whatever their priorities were and say, nope, what's more important for me today is to go listen to him. And they've gone up there and what he's telling them is, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to learn what is good and what is evil and you have a responsibility to take whatever measures are necessary to eliminate the evil from your life as much as you have control over it. What he's not saying is you have to go eliminate evil from the world because that's not what his challenge here is. He says if your eye causes you to sin or your hand causes you to sin. So this is stuff that is in fact within our control. He's not talking about stuff out of our control here at all. He's making it very clear. And the stuff that we can control, what he says is, we must control. Those of you who are on the reading plan with us, if we flip back in our book of Genesis, after Cain slew Abel, we're in chapter 4 of Genesis, all the way to the beginning of our Bibles. We're in chapter 4, and this is after Cain, verse 5, became very angry with Abel, and he kills Abel. And uh, actually, before he kills Abel, God confronts Cain in Cain's state of being upset that Abel's offering was. Uh, accepted or respected and Cain's offering was rejected and God says why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen in other words what is God saying when he asks those questions those are rhetorical questions what is he really saying to Cain more so think beyond that what is he saying yeah he's saying why are you like this you know you screwed up what are you mad at anybody else for? What are you jealous of anybody else for? You know you did not do well. And so he goes on to say, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Yeah, that, that was the expectation. Then. Sure. Both Cain and Abel had been taught what it meant to do well. And therefore be Abel did well, Cain did not. Therefore, Abel was received and Cain was not but God says to him why are you so upset you know what the rules are why don't you just comply why is it so tough and he then says and if you do not do well sin lies at the door and his desire is for you but you should rule over it its desire is for you is it's He's, this is a, uh, a way of saying that sin wants to rule over you. But Cain, you have to understand it's your responsibility to rule over it. And when God later says the definition of sin is he who knows to do well and does not do it. Found in the New Testament. Well, it's all the way back here at the very beginning given us that definition. So Jesus isn't giving them actually a new principle at all. He's just telling them the very same principle in a different way to make the very same point. So the point is we as individuals have a responsibility to cooperate with God 
And that cooperation must be on whose terms? God's terms. You see, Cain wanted to cooperate on his own terms and God said, nope, not going to happen. Furthermore, he says to the people who have the sin of lust in their eyes, meaning your eyes part of your mind, right? Your brain, actually, which implicates what goes on in your mind. He's saying if you don't fix this, what's the outcome? That you'll lose some rewards in heaven, right? What does he say the consequence is? Twice that you're going to be cast into hell. Yeah. Notice he doesn't say you'll be cast out of heaven as if you were already there. The point is you'll be cast into hell. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the understanding it's appointed man wants to die and then the judgment. You go before Jesus in the judgment and you're going to be sent one place or another. He says, if you don't fix this problem and prioritize righteousness and holiness in your life, you are going to be cast into the place you don't want to go. Because what you didn't want to do is love and worship and serve me the way I require you to. These statements also indicate to us that God does have a level of requirement and expectation that we must meet. It is a false statement to think that God in his monergistic ways, has no real requirement of us and no real expectation of us because he's going to do all this stuff for us. He's indicating very clearly there is a standard. I have communicated the standard to you. It is knowable by you. It is achievable by you. And it is required of you. These are all very important things to recognize of what he's telling them by saying to them what he is saying. Does that make sense? Now, where do we find in the provision here, does he say, well, unless you didn't know that you had lust for the woman, or unless you didn't know that your hand was causing you to sin. You see, that's not going to be an acceptable excuse because what he's essentially telling us here is such sins are in fact known and just because you say you really didn't know or understand is not going to be a plausible excuse. Because that's a lot of times what people say, right? When they give you 20% effort, what do they say to you? I did my best. I tried my hardest. Right? And you know that's bollocks. Or I didn't know you wanted more. All the excuses that fly out of people's mouths is a self-defense. So God is making it very clear here what the standard is. He knows it's knowable by us. And we're not going to be able to fool him into thinking that we actually tried our best when he knows we didn't. So what he's telling us is here's what your best is. I appreciate that you're going to tell me that you just kept doing it and kept doing it and didn't know how to fix it. You know what I told you to do to fix it? Grab a spoon and pluck your eye out. Grab a machete and cut your hand off. You can't pick things up if you have no hand. So your point is exactly right, Howard. No matter what it takes, whatever the degree is you have to go to, you must go there to eliminate the sin in your life. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility, not God's. Here's the next thing you have to realize. Where in this instruction does he say, if you're lusting after women, I'll just remove the women in your life that you lust after? Where does he say that I'll just remove the things from your life that you think you want to pick up that are not yours? Put the entirety of the the action on us. You follow? He doesn't even say he's going to remove the temptation. Because if he removes the temptation, he also removes the ability for us to choose to love and serve him in deference to or above anything else. There's no test. test. And so these things are important to grasp from such stories. 
And so what is God revealing to us about himself? Well, I would submit to you, one of the things he's revealing is he, in fact, is a God of holiness and purity. That's what he requires of us as well. He is a God who tests everyone. He is a God with standards that have to be met. Now the big confusion that comes from a lot of people is, wait a minute, we're not saved by works. That's the big argument that comes out. That our work. That, that particular issue is like such a major point of confusion amongst Christians. It is. It is. You're absolutely right. On one side or the other, not realizing that they're not mutually exclusive. That's correct. That's correct. So I'm going to give you an explanation of that so that you have it and you hopefully will never forget it ever again. And that is, in order to be born again, the power of giving you new birth, the power of cleansing you from your sin and giving you a fresh slate of righteousness doesn't come from you at all. It comes from God. That's what he's talking about when he's saying it's not of works lest anyone can boast. Because no matter what you do, without that power that is God's alone, there is no hope. And that is God's alone. And he gives it freely because nobody compels him to do it. But without exception, no one receives such gift without humbling themselves surrendering to Him, confessing to Him, repenting unto Him, which are all works, without which God has already done, would be useless. All of those things I just named, without what God has done, makes no change. So the salvation is that which God has done. And we didn't help Him do it. We didn't make it better. We didn't make it more powerful. We didn't make it available to more or less people. That's the part He's talking about that is not of our works at all. But the synergy of the cooperation that we must have with Him absolutely are a work that we must do. And in order to remain or abide in Him, there are works that we have to do to demonstrate that our faith is genuine, is real. Okay? So you should never have a challenge for what that means when you read the various passages or you end up in discussions with other people. So we move on. Verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. <coughs> Well, in our society, that makes potentially lots of problems, doesn't it? So we better figure this out so we're not unclear. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In fact, was given to the nation Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 24. So let's turn back there. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Chapter 24 24. and verse 1. Hmm. 
Deuteronomy, so it's the fifth book in the Torah, also called the Pentateuch. Chapter 24, verse 1. You're okay. You're all right. Take your time. Don't be nervous. You're fine. I'm not nervous. I have uh, dry hands. Chapter 24. Verse 1. Yes. Chapter 24, verse 1. The Lord says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife and goes on with the rest of the story, basically saying that if she marries another, she can never go back to the first husband. So, Interesting here. Moses, in fact, says this is a possibility, right? Listen to what Jesus says. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Who is the one Jesus is referring to that is saying this? God or man? When God records Deuteronomy chapter 24, does he say that he wants the man to give the woman a certificate of divorce? No, this is just the policy. This is just the narrative of what's happening. If you do this, then here's what one of the consequences are. You follow? So he's talking about the practice that they would ensue. Now, next thing is the Jews came up with a list of all sorts of things that could qualify her as having some form of uncleanness, which included making breakfast poorly <laughs> and such the like. Basically, they made up any possible reason they could to want to discharge a wife to changes socks. And this became prevalent in the society because it was the religious leaders that were teaching this and they claimed that this is what God meant when he said those things. So therefore the people were following the false teachings. Jesus is hitting those head on. Okay? And he's saying but I say to you now do you think that Jesus would say I know the father said this to you but I say that to you yeah. not a chance so that's your first inclination that what he is speaking about is not the father had given them an instruction but that men had taken upon themselves to develop an instruction claiming it came from God when it was out of the deceitful heart of man. It's exactly right. And so he says, but I say to you, in other words, they're all wrong, listen to what's right. And then he says, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality... Now the term there, if you we see sexual immorality is a is our way in English of trying to describe the Greek term that's there. The Greek term that is there is for fornication. What's fornication? Sex outside of marriage. So in the terrestrial sense, it is sex outside of marriage. Remember, always these terrestrial examples teach celestial lessons. There are two parts. So what does fornication teach us about the celestial lesson? What is the, 
lesson we're supposed to understand here? Faithfulness. Faithfulness uh, would be a secondary stage, but it includes faithfulness, yes. So to start with, the basis of the union's got to be God-directed, right? It's got to be a genuine covenantal commitment in Christ to start with. What is fornication? People getting together to enjoy the privileges of what is supposed to be reserved for marriage without the covenant and commitment of marriage. Right? And so he says, if you find this is the condition of your wife, now how can a wife, by the way, if we think of the traditional definition of fornication, how can someone who is married commit fornication you see fornication in a terrestrial sense is for those who are not married for those who are married what do they commit adultery, adultery. no longer called fornication you follow it's the same kind of sin but it has two different names depending on, uh, upon the status of the individual so what is Jesus talking about here by using the term for fornication but that somebody actually entered into a relationship without the commitment, without the general, without the significance of the covenantal commitment that they were determined on when they made the relationship. But what did they want instead? Just the privileges part, without the covenantal commitment. And how do we come to know this? By their fruit, by their practice. Right? Not just because we suspect and the fruit and the practice has to be relevant or related to the subject matter. We can't say, gosh darn it, she got my white socks blue again. That's it, she's an adulteress. <laughs> right? We don't get to make such leaps. But there are ways to determine if the person has in fact made such a covenantal commitment. Because just as the previous passage told us that we, if we are children of God, have a covenantal commitment with Him. And in the previous passage, who is the husband and who is the wife? The passage that talks about the condition of our eye or the condition of our hand. Who is the husband and who is the wife? And you say to me, wait a minute, it doesn't talk about husbands and wives in there. Where are you going with this? It's talking about the whole body. So a man and a woman become one flesh. So man and woman do become one flesh. So the answer is found at the end of each of those passage parts. What happens to the one who does not take the measures to eradicate the sin from their life? They're cast into hell. By whom? The husband. God. And, the wife is the church. and we, as the church, are the wife. And what does God require of us? To accept the washing of the water of His Word that we would be cleansed and purified and be blameless and spotless. Read Ephesians 5, 21-25. That is a terrestrial setting instruction for the celestial lesson that we're talking about. The reason the man plays the role of Jesus and the wife the role of the church is because it's to teach this celestial lesson. And we have our husband speaking to us about what he requires of his wife. And if you look in the Old Testament, when Yehovah said to Israel, you wicked and adulterous generation. Was he talking about the fact that they were sleeping around? No, they were cheating on him. Cheating on him how? By worshiping other gods. Yeah, by worshiping other gods. Exactly right. But still taking his name. But still his name. taking his name and wanting the privileges. We have the protections of Yehovah because we're his, although they we're worshiping other gods. Doing things our own way. So it had nothing to do with the physical 
sexual relations they were having. It had to do with the spiritual attention given to the relationship. So it is incorrect to limit physical relations as what God is talking about as the only mechanism for finding an unfaithful wife by the way or an unfaithful husband because he deals with that when he says and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery he's talking about the initiator here okay so back to your point earlier Howard faithfulness is the key but it has to begin with genuineness genuineness has a beginning and must be perpetuated and we understand genuineness is perpetuated only by faithfulness okay if it's disingenuous to start it will never be faithful if it's genuine to start later it can be faithful or unfaithful and what Jesus is talking about is women in the first sense or men in the second sense when he talks about a woman who is divorced if either party abandons their covenantal commitment you have not the responsibility but the opportunity to separate from them does that make sense here's the problem with these statements we just like the ancient Jews can fall in the trap of making up all sorts of reasons why we're going to say our husband or wife are unfaithful because we just don't like the relationship anymore so what would the measure or the standard be for us to determine faithfulness or unfaithfulness in the marriage relationship how would we come up with a standard that we don't just make up on our own the word of God is the answer that's correct that's exactly correct we don't add to like I said earlier or subtract from the word of the Lord but the word of the Lord is our standard I can see where the Jewish elite would have uh, a whole bunch of different uh, they did ah. yeah it's called the Mishnah and it's all sorts of rules and laws and things they made up and this is a big part of it giving them the latitude license to do whatever it gave them the license to become God yeah. I'm missing it I could have swore it was in this passage because I know there's, a, there's another time that Jesus references this very idea mm-hmm. and he, but he, then he outlines why it was God allowed it in Deuteronomy for the hardness of their hearts right we're, but that's not here we're, we're no um, uh, chapter 19 verse 8 there you go Alex is ahead of us. So the question was, Howard wanted to know where does Jesus speak about the same subject and talk about uh, that Moses had in fact provided them with uh, an opportunity to uh, divorce their wives. And uh, the reference uh, where else Jesus talks about this is in Matthew chapter 19 verses 8 and 9. Yeah, up in verse 3, right. Hey, it word for word what we just read. Right. <laughs> and so, these are the things to keep in mind. Now, I want to bring to your attention, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter seven, beginning in verse ten. First Corinthians chapter seven, 
verse 10. So 1 Corinthians in the New Testament to the right here. Over here. 1 Corinthians after Romans, Ephesians too far. Galatians and 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Seven. I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 10. Oh, okay. Chapter 7, verse 10. Principles and marriage. Chapter 7, verse 10. The Lord tells us, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is also not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? This particular passage speaks about the subject that we're talking about very emphatically. What the Lord is talking about here is people who come to Him after being married. Nowhere in here is He talking about coming to him and then choosing to marry a non-believer. He's talking about you're already married, you come to Christ and realize your spouse, husband or wife, is not a believer. What do I do? Do I leave him or her or do I stay? That's the question. Now remember when the relationship was begun and the marriage was announced, this civil union that they have it was done when both of them were not believers in Christ now one is what does he do what does she do so first thing he says is your first step is not to separate that's not your first step but what does he require of the spouse that is the believer. Well, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. So, what does that mean? They are actively working to, to sanctify their spouse. That's right. It means the believing spouse Angel. is actively and practically living out their faith publicly in the midst of this unbelieving spouse and children that need to be sanctified. A spiritual example. Correct. It's not you doing it all on your own. It's not you going hiding in a closet and keeping your faith to yourself because you have this ominous okay. spouse who says, I hate this in my house. Okay? And it's not that you allow the unbelieving spouse to corrupt the minds of your kids. Or yourself. Or yourself. That's right. But you are publicly and purposefully living out, coming, hearing, and doing the will of the Lord. One of two things is going to happen. Either the unbelieving spouse will be sanctified or the unbelieving spouse will depart. It is incredibly unlikely especially given so many things the Lord has told us, that the unbelieving spouse will just be apathetic. Here's why. Let's say the spouse says, yeah, I'm okay with that. You just do all that stuff, no problem, and I'll just be quiet. What do you think the chances are of the unbelieving spouse 
not giving a bad example to the kids. He's a bad example in his passivity, which the believing spouse must do what with? Point out, to Point out to the children that it's not okay, right? And that there are consequences for it. <coughs> you follow? Yeah. And when that happens, the unbelieving spouse is either going to hear and turn or get angry and leave. And leave. You follow? This is why Jesus says darkness and light can't coexist. Good and evil don't go together. You follow? But what do most people do in our contemporary culture who say they come to Christ and are married to an unbelieving spouse but keep everything quiet and hidden because they don't want to upset the family? God says, no, this is supposed to be the instrument of bringing light to the family. What do we just read? You have to be salt. You have to be light. And if you're not, you're good for nothing. So if you come to Christ after you've been married to someone who is not a believer, because you also weren't a believer, and you're converted, you must be that salt and that light in the home. The light must shine throughout the home. And what will happen is either others will also come to the light or the cockroaches will run. One or the other. But the person who says they're a follower of Christ, who hides their so-called faith, so they don't disrupt the family is a person who is not obedient to the word of the Lord and not abiding in Christ despite the claim because the mechanism for God having that person stay in the home and be that light is an attempt to rescue the spouse and to lead the children unto the kingdom of God in righteousness And therefore, if then that spouse becomes a purposeful contaminant, an intentional toxin, you have every right to depart from them. And depending on the situation, may be handled differently, especially for women and men. So how this relates back to our original standard. If the original commitment was disingenuous, disingenuous and you are a follower of Christ and you find this out, you will live as that salt and that light in your home getting to see if you can change the mind of your spouse to become genuine to start with. Second, if it was genuine and the person has backslidden or fallen away, you're being salt and light to see if you can recover your spouse back unto the way, the way of Christ, the way of truth and life. This is the effort he's telling us that we must put forth and we must be about doing. But if that spouse, given all that intention and that effort, becomes more volatile, more uh, anxious, more toxic. Right? You have to do something about it, especially if it's for the children you're trying to protect. And so there's purposeful teaching, and then there are other steps you may have to take. Just like in the story of if your eye causes you to sin or your hand causes you to sin. You go through your series of progressions in your mind and in your practical actions to figure out what will it take and go as far as you need to go in order to make it happen. Okay? But for people who are against Christ, not following his instructions and choosing just to do whatever they want, we would be committing adultery if we were to then go and choose such a person to be our spouse. Because by definition, that person is acting anti-Christian. As a child of God, we are forbidden by him to take them on as a spouse anyway. And if we took them on, what would 
he say we are committing? Adultery. Why are we committing adultery if we're deciding to take a spouse and we're not yet married, which is a subject reserved for married people? Because adultery in this case is talking about our relationship with God that we're going to be committing adultery against. You see, in a terrestrial sense, two unmarried people can't commit adultery. They can only commit fornication. How would it then, if we're unmarried and choosing an ungodly spouse, be able to commit adultery? Because the adultery is against our true husband, God. And unless you pay attention to the words and how they're used and the sequence that they're used, you can't even pick this up. Because fornication and adultery are not the same thing because of the positions of the people. The offices that they hold, the anointings they've been given. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions about that subject before we move on? I can tell you for years this was a subject I had to study and study and study and study because I first started listening to this stuff and hearing what other people said about this subject. It caused me real distress between Dina and I. I mean, she and I are both previously married and divorced. A lot of years ago. Seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? <laughs> but nevertheless, I had to figure this out because I had to understand whether what I was doing was right in God's eyes or wrong in God's eyes. That was very important to me. And there's lots and lots of false teaching about this subject. Verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old... You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. This is an interesting subject for some. They want to know, okay, what is... Huh? Is this a reference to fealty? The oath? Did you refer to, like, paying fealty to a king? I'm going to swear an oath of allegiance to you. No, what he's talking about is the character of the individual in this lesson. What do people who have low character think they need to do when they make a commitment? Convince the other person. they got to somehow convince the other person that their commitment is true. Why do you have to try to convince somebody? If your character is known to be somebody who always keeps his or her word, how much effort do you have to go through to convince somebody what you're telling them is true? You follow? So what he's talking about is people who are generally not keepers of their word and now what they got to say is no I really swear this time yeah. and what do they do with their graduation of their swearing I swear by the altar I swear by, the, by Jerusalem by the I Lord swear God. on my life I'll do it that's what he's talking about on my mother's grave yeah exactly you follow he yeah. says no stop all that nonsense if you keep your word nobody's going to question it nobody's going to question your follow through so if you say yes, do yes. <clears throat> and it's okay to say no, but then do no. Whatever your word is, keep it. No amount of verbal assurance offsets crappy character. Hey, your actions are. Actions speak louder than words. That's what he's talking about here. Okay? Well, and also he says, 
shall perform your oaths to the Lord, so in your commitment to the Lord as well, in, as a general sense, and that is, look, commit to me or don't, but don't say you are and then not do it. That's right. That's, that's what the reference is, again, in Deuteronomy, yeah. it's the same, same chapter, I think, 23. He's not telling them, make your oath to the Lord. He says, if you make an oath to the Lord, don't delay. Go and do it, because it's a serious matter. Right. But it's, again, not a command from God to do it that way. And then the Jews took that and ran with it and threw into the Mishnah any kind of an oath that was made at any time, anywhere. And how would you make people sure that your oath was true? Well, you'd swear by something great. (laughs) And that's, God says, no, nonsense. Do what you commit to do. Don't do the things you commit not to doing. And you'll be in good shape. People will know your character. Even if they don't like it, they'll still know it. You see, people that even in my past who have, I've had to confront in their sin, all of those people have known me well enough to know what I'm going to do about it. None of them come back to me later and say, can't we just work this out? Because I already know what the answer is. There's no compromise. No, you've got to cut the eye out or cut the hand off. That's the answer. So we're not going to capitulate with your sin. So none of them come back to me and negotiate. Because they know there is no negotiation. It is black and white. And it's that simple. And you either love God or you don't. And if you do, then let your yes be yes. Furthermore, what does he say about people who think that they have to add something to their commitment by giving some swearing? Who does he say that comes from? The evil one. The devil. So as children of God, what should we do when we hear somebody say something like that? We should be very concerned just to start with when somebody thinks they need to do such a thing. Because the origins of this, Jesus says, are Satan. So why as children of God would we believe somebody's commitment that we know that originates from Satan himself? Why would we ever say, oh, I think this time it might be really true? When Jesus tells us that the commitment's origin by nature of what is being given is the devil. See, these are ways to instantly recognize certain things without having to ask a lot of questions. So if somebody ever says to you, no, I promise I'll pay you back. I swear on my mother's grave. You should instantly know, guess what? It's a lie. Such swearing should be of no help to you. I mean, trying to think about it really logically, what does that even mean? Right. <laughs> I swear by my mother's grave. I mean, is it some magic spell that's going to make your mom come back to life? Yeah, that's somebody who do it. What, what's going on? That's somebody who thinks his mom's spirit's still out there, yeah. looking out for him and watching over him, and he's trying to impress her and all these things. Tales from the crypt. Yeah, tales from the crypt. Right. You follow where we're going to this? So he's talking about being a person of character <laughs> to do what you commit to doing. If you say something, then do it. And nothing in between. Even if it costs you, it's not okay to then come back and say, why? Well, it cost me too much to do that, so I just didn't do it. He says, no, 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 no. Your yes be yes. Period. Count the cost before you say yes, is what he'll teach us in a little bit here. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This is a passage that begins with a true statement that God does say, but is taken out of context 
So to begin with, this is Jesus teaching us that context matters. It's not minorly important, it's vitally important. The only occurrence where God says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is in the situation where there are two parties that cannot agree and need a third party to adjudicate a matter, a judge. And they bring the matter before the judge. And the judge is charged with the responsibility of hearing the matter and making a decision and meeting out the penalty or the consequence. And in the matter, the judge hears the, ma the matter. He decides party A is the offender and party B is the victim. And the consequence is that party B gets to extract something from party A. God says the limit is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It is not that in every case that's what you'll do. He says the limit is. Party B can actually forgive party A. They can have mercy on him and require nothing. If, if there's a judge, it's the judge though. Even party if the B. judge says, party A, you have to give an eye to party B. Party B has the right to instead say, I forgive you, and not require it of him. God has judged us guilty of sin, condemned to death, child, children of his wrath. Jesus came and forgave us of that sin by the sacrifice, by the living of his life, the sacrifice of his life, the resurrection of his life, and the ascension into heaven. And he is our advocate before the Father to say, I've paid it for them. He doesn't have to pay it anymore. Todd no longer owes you that debt. I paid it for him. The judge says to party A, party A, you owe party B and I. Part of me says, I'll pay it for him. I don't require it of him. Judge, I paid the penalty for party A. He no longer owes me the I. The judge will say, okay. Case dismissed. Case dismissed. I struggle with how to apply this to my life. Because I, I read this passage, and my first thought is, okay, so if I come home and somebody's burglarizing my house, am I supposed to help them lift my TV into their car? No. <laughs> But even the people at the top of that 
Israeli caste system are, are still suffering under Rome's requirements, right? And so you have this um, cultural forced system of hierarchy that's in place. And those who think they are better than another person, because to a Rome, what was an Israelite? Beneath them. A dog. Yeah, a slave. Yeah, a slave. And to the religious elite, what were the common people of Israel like? Peasants. Peasants, right? And to the middle class peasants, what were the lower class like? You follow? This is a mental picture you have to have when you're taking in such lessons. Because God is not looking for you to walk around town saying, if you slap me on my right cheek, I'm going to give you my left. If you want to come burglarize my house, you get to have all the stuff. I'll help you with the TV. I'll help you with the TV. That's not what he's looking for. What he's helping us understand is, you also have to remember the other part of the setting. Never forget this. We just read Revelation. What's the difference between the setting we're in in Matthew and the setting of Revelation? Well, God, Jesus is alive and with his disciples. He's alive in Revelation too. And he's with his disciples in Revelation. Here's the, here, here's the answer. Here's the answer. In Matthew, it is the dispensation of salvation. He is coming to save. In Revelation, it's the dispensation of a conquering king. He is coming to eliminate his enemies. In the dispensation of salvation, he's trying to teach his enemies to stop being his enemies and to become his children. When the time of Revelation comes and he's wrapping it up at the end, Whoever is his enemy will be his enemy still in the eternal lake of fire for eternal torment. That is not what he's trying to do now. He's trying to convince them now in the dispensation we have during the time of the Gospel of Matthew. He's trying to say to them, stop rebelling against God. You need to understand the consequences for that are dire, are tremendous. Then you need to tell others. And you need to show and tell others how to be saved. There will be a time when that time's over and it's time to conquer the enemy. Right now, it's trying, time to convince our enemies to stop being an enemy. So how does that help us with the burglar that breaks in to collect the TV? Yeah, or like the person that sues. I mean, sues me for 100 bucks, so I'm giving you 200. So I'll give you an example. A very personal example. I'll tell you how I handled this. I used to volunteer at the high school. Most of you have heard parts of this story. And in my volunteerism there, I became known. I stepped into an occurrence out on a football field. After the football game, I was attacked at the end, knocked unconscious, and beaten up by three men. After I woke up, I didn't just say, Lord, forgive them. I helped the police track them down and arrest each one of them. And each one of them stood trial for what they had done. The first young man was a young man that I personally was responsible for him graduating high school. Without me, he didn't make it. The school had given up on him, the principal had given up on him, and asked me if I would take him on as a special personal project to help him graduate, and I took him on, and I personally held his hand all the way through to graduation. A year later, he's one of the attackers on the football field. In the midst of the trial, he turned to me, asked the judge if he could have permission to speak to me, and the judge granted it to him, and he asked me for forgiveness. What do you think I did? I gave him a hug and forgave him. And then I told him, don't do anything like this ever again, otherwise the consequences will be worse. The second young man did the exact same thing. The third man 
never apologized for what he did, demanded he was innocent, went through the full trial, and was convicted of a higher crime and given a worse sentence than the first two. And, because he didn't confess and repent, I gave him no forgiveness. Because I had none to give him. So if the person's breaking into my home, first of all, if my wife and children are there, he's going to find a gun in his face. And told that he's a threat to my family, and he better get on his knees and pray I don't shoot him. Once he's arrested and secured, then I can have the conversation with him about what's important. The thing that messes with me, though, is that I do not resist an evil person. Yeah, so do so not resist an evil person. There's a different definition of resist. So, in the case of a Jew, and he's speaking to these people, who would they think are the evil people? Romans. Romans, to start with. Romans. Who have authority over their life without breaking the law to take stuff, Enslave, all sorts of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Without breaking the law. Yeah. So he's saying, don't resist them. Go along with it. So you have been, of course, okay. and the right to be able for them to do those things. But they would consider them an evil person, right. and the oppression that they're experiencing is not contrary to the actual laws of the land. Because the Roman can come in, take things from them if they want, slap them if they want, load them up with a load and say, carry this for me. It's actually one of the laws of the Romans. They can compel you to carry their crap for a mile. And he says, no, don't go one, go two. In other words, show them it doesn't bother you to serve them. Because a servant is greatest in the kingdom of God. This is what he's talking about. It is not a license to let people break the law and you're just supposed to help them. I knew that. <laughs> and it's kind of reconciled too. And know? it is also not an excuse to abdicate your responsibility to protect your wife and children. Okay? It's, it's that, that thing of the, the laws of the land uh, going against the laws of the Lord and we don't go along with them. But if they're not in conflict, we have no reason to say no to them. That's right. Let's look at the book of Esther. When the Persians were in control of the nation Israel, what did they do? They needed a new wife for the king. They went and rounded up some of the Israel, Israeli daughters. What does God say? Don't resist the evil person. Look, you're enslaved by them because I put you there. Because you needed to learn a lesson. And along the way, if you are one of the good apples, you are to be a light in a barrel of bad apples. And be willing to sacrifice your life that you have now for the eternal life with me for eternity. Sort of like, I'll pay the taxes because they are consequences if I don't, but I have a higher purpose. That's right, I have a higher purpose. And so right now, we're still in the time of salvation. So if somebody's breaking the law, you never capitulate with them. Then you'd be a lawbreaker also. Then you'd be a lawbreaker also. But if they're within their right... So I'll give you another example in my life. We, Dina and I, own some property in downtown San Diego. Legally ours. Title and deed. And the city of San Diego decided they wanted the property. And we said, no, we don't want to give it to you. We occupy our business there, and we don't want to give it up. And they said, guess what, though? We have a law that says we get to take it from you and pay you what is considered so-called fair market value. What is my responsibility? To not resist them. They're doing according to the law. I just need to figure out what fair market value is to optimize whatever I'm going to get in exchange for the thing I don't want to give up. The point is, they were within their legal right to take the building. I'm, ben I'm fortunate that they also had a legal responsibility to pay me fair market value, which I certainly sought. Right? So that I could turn that into 
different investments. But the point was, what if I wanted to resist them and just fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and, and, and then if I keep and pay all sorts of lawyers and when I keep losing and losing then I surround it with my guns and my ammunition and say take it out of my dead cold hands and he's saying look knock all that off and they have artillery at Balboa you follow? you did lose that property that you got fair correct we lost that property they built the Petco Park there well near it near it and then they used that property for investment for the owners of Petco Park so that they could create a big retail center and higher value properties and all sorts of things. So it's a way to line rich people's pockets. But nevertheless, if they're within their legal right to do it. And so you go along with it because they have the authority. You decided to buy property at sea with Captain Turner. Yeah. So the message behind all of this is just because we would say somebody is, is an evil person, we don't then just disconnect from them and not associate with them and not allow them to do things that are within their legal right to do. So you know you're evil, but I don't feel anything you say. Yeah, <laughs> but in our society, if somebody comes up like they came up and beat me up, I don't go to court and say, you want to do it again? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how stupid is that? Because by attacking me, they were violating the law, assaulting me, outside their legal rights, and I gave them the responsibilities that were theirs under the law. And just because I forgave them, because they confessed and repented to me, doesn't mean that the law has to not give them the penalty. I don't get. I don't have the authority to tell the law you can't put them in jail. <laughs> That's not within my authority to do. Right. What did they do with the one that did? The two that confessed got uh, probation, and the one that didn't confess and was tried got three years in jail. And then, obviously, a higher a record of a higher offense. Yeah. Does that help you understand? Completely. Good. Anybody else have questions about that subject? So, yeah. I mean, as, as far as that goes, and the whole the loss of the land being things we have to be obedient to, I right. think that puts a great responsibility on us to know what the laws of the Lord are, yeah. so that we can determine whether the law of the land crosses the law of God. Or not. Right. Otherwise, we would just go well. The government said I have to do it, so I have to do it. And then it turns out to be an evil thing. That's right. Have done it. That's right. And so, there is no way to make a list of all the possible situations this is going to apply to. The Jews tried it, probably. Yeah, I'm sure they tried. Alright? This is where you've got to know the word of the Lord well, be abiding in Christ, led by the Spirit, so when you're in a situation, He tells you what to do. There's no way to make an exhaustive enough list to know. Yeah. But remember, the basis is this is a time of salvation. And we need to be willing to do a lot of things to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he gives us tools to do that with. Tool number one, our life. Other tools things we own, things we have, situations we're in, relationships we have. These are all tools. And in and amongst them are going to be some evil people. And we need to remember that our purpose in their lives, within the confines of the boundaries God gives to us, we are trying to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our privilege and our responsibility. So let's go be those people.